thank you for inviting. Um, it's always nice to be here. I think it's my third lecture. And to be here and talk about what I do and what I, how I work, it's at the same time as I'm trying to give something to you, it also gives a lot to me. Because I, I'm reflecting myself in telling you about what I do. So I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Um, two things, like technical things. If you don't understand something, please stop me and ask. And let's keep this a, kind of as a, you know, like as a friendly, friendly conversation. So don't be shy to ask if something doesn't make sense to you. The other thing is, I'm telling you what I believe, and maybe it's bullshit, maybe it's wrong, but it's what I believe. So question it and, you know, have your own opinion, and I'm sure you will find other people who have different opinions. But this is my, my way of, of thinking, what I want to share with you today. Um, short filmmaking. So this is uh, me um, doing my first short film. Um, I was uh, 15 then, and I was um, also the, the actor. So I was wearing a costume here, and I was also doing the camera, and this is my little brother. And I don't really understand today how I managed to be the actor and the cameraman and the director at the same time. Um, but this is a nice uh, kind of memory picture from my first, first short film. So let's ask, start with the questions I want to discuss with you. Why a short film? Why not a long film? Why not a music video? Or why are we talking about short films today? Why do I believe short films are important to be made by you? And by me, I did a couple. This is the first question. Uh, the second one is how. How to do short films, how to come up with an idea, how to write it, how to raise the money, how to uh, put it together, how to put a crew together, how to shoot, how to post-produce, and then what to do with the film after it's finished. Um, yeah, so, and, and, and as, a, as an example, my, my last short film I did is the short film Bon Voyage. Um, and I'm always using this short film as an example for things I want to explain to you. Bon Voyage is quite a big project. Um, I was a bit unsure if this is the perfect project because it may, might also scare some of you because it's a really huge, huge project. And my biggest short film and maybe also my last short film before I start to make long films. But it's, I just did it a few weeks ago, so I think it's a good example to show you what I mean on my own short film, Beau Voyage. But, uh, you know, break it down to your individual project you might be working on. So, yeah, and my goal is I want you to walk home tonight ready to make a short film as soon as possible. Um, I, this is my goal. I want you to, to feel confident and secure and inspired to start Maybe you already did a couple of short films, sorry, maybe some of you are already feature film, long filmmakers, but my goal is that you feel it's easy to make a short film. This is what I hope you will feel like tonight, after my lecture. So, some of, me, uh, some of you know me already. Um, I'm Swiss-British, I'm born in Switzerland, but I was raised in Germany. I knew quite early that I want to direct film, and I didn't went to film school. I didn't want to go to film school. I started as a production assistant um, when I was 17, 18. And then I started to, uh, to shoot direct commercials when I was 23. I was quite lucky. Got support by some a producer who wanted me to work for him because I was cheap. Like young directors are always cheaper than senior directors. Um, and it was good, so I, I gathered a lot of experience, and now I'm still doing commercials and, and um, feature films. I'm just preparing my first two long feature films. So, and I very much like to be in Kiev. I'm in Kiev since 10 years. I was here maybe 40 times. Um, I feel this city is, for me, one of the most inspiring cities in the world. You know, I think Paris is beautiful and New York is cool and Berlin is sexy. But I think those cities are, they are nice, but I think in Kiev I see more future because there is so much 
still to be done. Um, and I like this, this energy, and especially also here in the, in the academy. So this is why I'm here. So m these are the short films I did so far. I did um, five short films. The first one about escaping is from the photograph you saw in the beginning. I was like, yeah, a kid, a child, actually. I shot it on Super 8. Um, I think the budget of this film was 50, 50 um, dollars or something. Um, the second film I made is Taxi Munich. Um, this is a film I um, managed to shoot maybe on the budget of $5,000 um, with all my friends and the support I got um, as a young filmmaker. Then um, Twilight, so now it becomes a bit, and now I have posters. Twilight is a film I shot 2008 in Berlin. Um, it's a film I wrote myself. I, I wrote the screenplay, which was a mistake here. I, it's a terrible screenplay. Um, but I shot this in 2008, and then I moved to New York. And in New York, I shot Hotel Pennsylvania. Both of those films are financed just by myself. I had the chance through advertising to save money and, and finance those films myself. So the budget of this film was $30,000, $30, the budget of this film was $40,000. Um, now I just finished this film, Bon Voyage. Bon Voyage, the budget was $250,000, quarter million dollars, which is um, a different scale, but I was, I think, very lucky with this film, and I will tell you about it later, why I also needed so much money. But what I want to is tell you, you can today, even with, you know, with your iPhone, you can shoot a short film. Um, a budget should never keep you away. The most difficult thing I learned by those five short films, some of them are really bad. Um, what I learned is it's not about the budget. It's very much really about your idea. How good is the idea? And if you have a good idea, if you have a good screenplay, the people will come. The actors will come. Um, and they want to help you. People are not stupid. They can sense it. If you have a good idea and if you, have a, if you are a visionary, people will help you. So never let money stop you from doing a short film. But we're going a little bit more into that later. But money definitely is a factor to talk about. So now I'm curious to hear also a bit who are you guys. Um, I think, you know, I, I'm... I'm it's, it's the director, the regisseur is always somehow known as like the, the most, maybe people, especially in Europe, people talk about the author cinema. A film is from a director, but a film is just as much from the producer and also from the writer. Um, those are, I think, in the, in, the, in the birth process of a film, the most important partners, uh, not most important parents of a film. And I think it's important that you ask yourself, what am I? It's, most people want to be a director. It's always like people want to be a director. Producer, mm. in America a little bit more, because in America people think more about money. And when they think they're going to be a producer, they think of Harvey Weinstein and lots of money. Um, but in Europe, everyone wants to be a director. But um, a director is a nobody without a producer. And as a good director, you can only be good if you found a good producer to make the film with you. And then, of course, the third person is the writer. And um, without a good screenplay, you don't have a good movie. And I believe writers and directors, writing and directing, are two different talents. Some people are really good directors, and some people are really good writers. And sometimes the writer and the director are the same person. But I think it's important to understand that if you are a good director, it doesn't mean that you must be a good writer as well. Don't be afraid or shy to find a writer and work with a writer. The same thing is for a writer. If a writer is a good writer, don't think you must direct. Um, some of the greatest, most genius films are, are not written you know, by, by the director. So, so who of you guys likes to write? Who of you considers themselves as a 
future or maybe already screenwriter. You're right. Nice. Oh, nice. Very good. So you, the direct, who are the directors amongst you? Cool. So, so you know her, so I, you should, are you also let other directors direct your scripts? You have some for other directors or you just write yes. for yourself? Yes, uh, also for other Okay, cool. Um, and who are, who considers themselves as a producer, who is the father of projects? Great. And what I forgot is are the cinematographers. The cinematographers who are, in a way, the, the connecting element between the writer and the director. The cinematographer is the painter, in a way, who helps to turn the vision of the director, the vision the director has when reading a screenplay into an image. Do we have uh, cinematographers here as well? Oh, all right. Good. <laughs> Okay, so I, I really, this is an important message for me. Directors, producers, and writers really work together and support each other. Um, I think this is a real good like, uh, technique or like a trick in a way to really look for great producers and as a producer look for great directors and as a director look for great writers and vice versa. Understand what you, what you feel best in, what you are most comfortable in, and then find good partners. Um, so this is Sam, Sam Fuller, um, a great American director, and it's quite of a famous photograph of the cliché image of a director, which is luckily very old, and the director today cannot, uh, is not such a, a, you know, today filmmaking is mostly not so loud anymore, and I think the directors I like, and it's also the way I like to direct is quite quiet um, and polite. So, the, if you want to make a film, all three f figures of a writer or producer or director can be the first person to start a project. As a producer, you can wake up in the morning and while you have your shower, you have an idea for a story and you call your writer friend. And, you know, or it's a, it's, so, uh, the first question is really, in the beginning, what is your idea? And the idea, I believe, can only be, be a good idea if the idea comes from your heart. If it's something you really want to tell. It's not, you shouldn't make a movie about a subject which you think is kind of a sexy subject right now and people want to see movies about it. No, do something which really is moving yourself then you will be a good writer and you will be a good director or a good producer if you feel personally, if you have this personal desire to tell the story. So this is the first thing, you know, the, 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 something which is interesting you, something personal. It could be a story about how did your grandfather met your grandmother. Or it could be a story about the most incredible sex you had with your teacher. It can be like a, 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 a provocating story but something you, maybe you experienced or a friend experienced. Or it can be a story about that you're afraid of the future. You don't know what will happen to Europe and the world will go down and nuclear power plants will explode and aliens will attack. But you really have this vision you're afraid and you want to make a film about it. These are just three very crazy different directions, but to explain that I think it's very important that it's personal and has something to do with yourself. Yeah, or, or, or a political reason is also very, 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 a very strong um, engine. You know, I think some of the greatest films were done in the 70s during the Vietnam War in the US. A lot of great filmmakers, if it's Stanley Kubrick or Oliver Stone, you know, they did their movies about their greatest, strongest movies about the Vietnam War. And I think just right now in, in Ukraine, there are a lot of political inspiration to make movies, short movies. The, yeah, I said it already. I think the audience will feel how much you believe in your subject. Um, so yeah, be in love, be angry about the story you write or you develop. So let's talk about Beau Voyage. This is a bit of a silly photo of myself, but um, <laughs> it, it is symbolizing, 
I want to tell you why I wrote a story for Bon Voyage and shot this film. So I like to sail. I like sailing. It's a big passion or hobby of mine. And I sail, uh, sail in the Atlantic, I crossed the Atlantic. I sailed um, in the Mediterranean Sea. And for me, sailing is something beautiful. It's like freedom, jump into the water for a swim. It's like luxury holiday. But suddenly, in the last few years, the Mediterranean Sea, which is one of the most beautiful sailing places, became a grave of thousands of dead people who tried to cross in little shitty boats from Africa to Europe. And suddenly, I saw my vision of the, my beautiful sailing holiday, I saw in danger. Suddenly, it was not about the beauty of sailing anymore, but the desperation of people trying to come to Europe. And it made me feel bad. I felt a bit guilty. How can I just, without any reason, um, go on a sailing boat and sail just for fun? I don't even have to transport something. It's not that I have to transport, you know, I don't know, like some materials on a boat. No, I'm just doing it. I'm putting, even I'm putting myself into danger. If you go sailing, it's always a little bit dangerous. And I'm just doing this for fun. And I see when I go to the coast anywhere in the world, I see hundreds, thousands, millions of sailing yachts. And they're just there, they're for fun. No one needs them. They're toys, very expensive toys. So, but now there are people who are escaping their home because they're being killed, and they don't have money for a nice sailing boat. They are in little shitty boats and they sink and drown and we in Europe we are afraid of them say so like no we cannot take you all your refugees into Europe we don't have the space and some countries close their borders and so out of that I started to think of the story of Bon Voyage um, yeah you will see later what Bon Voyage is about exactly so the next thing is, is maybe this is the, the the order could be other way around. Why to shoot a short film? A short film, first of all, a short film is never, unless you win an Academy Award. If you win an Oscar, it will make money. But otherwise, a short film will never make money. It's always just something, it's a training piece. Even if you are the daughter or the son of an oligarch and you have millions of dollars on your bank account, don't make a movie immediately. Make some short films first. Even if you could, you need to train. It's a good, you know, a short film, you maybe you shoot for five days, seven days, you shoot it 50 minutes, 20 minutes long. It's good to train. Don't go into 40 shooting days, 50 shooting days. Make a short film to tra for training, for yourself. The best, like, to teach yourself. And it's easier to finance. If you are not the son or the daughter of an oligarch and you need to finance it, it's easier to finance a short film than a feature film. And it's also easier to get people working for you. If you ask your friend, your, your sound engineer friend, and you say, hey, my sound engineer friend, I do a short film, can you work for free? He will ask, yeah, how long? If you say, for 50 days, he will not have time to work for free, most likely. But if that's just for six days, you know, and I'm going to make a good dinner for you and it's going to be fun, then he will work maybe for six days for free. So it's easier to make a short film, much easier. And then, of course, it's a great portfolio piece. If you make a good short film and people love it and it's going to be shown at film festivals and it becomes a Vimeo hit, advertising agencies will call you and say, oh, do you also do commercials? And Maybe even some movie producers will ask you to, to work with them. Even if you're the producer of a film and then of a short film and the short film is successful, you know, it's much easier to finance your feature films if you did a good short film. So that's why to make short films. So how short is a short? It's quite easy. As shorter as better. It's, it's, it's just, you know, for, for festivals, for example, you want, you need festivals, film festivals. And I will tell you about it later, why. But if, if your film is five minutes long, it takes five minutes time on the short fest film festival. 
But if your film is 25 minutes long, it takes five times more time in the program, so it needs to be very good. As longer your film is, as better it must be to get into festival and to get the attention. You know, like if you, if you watch on Vimeo Sunday afternoon, you're bored and you watch short films on Vimeo, um, if a short film is just five minutes, you quickly watch it. If it's not so good, maybe it was fun, but it's okay. But if it's 15 minutes and it gets boring, then you switch it off. So as shorter, as better. So um, the writing, writing process. I, I don't want to go into detail like with where do you get your inspiration and what time to get up to write and so on. It's not about this today. But it's more like the, the, the kind of the different elements you produce as a writer. The, the first thing which I think is important for you, but also for the people you present your project to, is um, the outline. Be able to tell your story in one sentence, just for yourself. This is Boboyash. During a holiday cruise, a sailing yacht encounters a sinking refugee boat. Inspired by the current events in the Mediterranean Sea. Two sentences. But it's, it's a log line. It's just, it's easy. It's like one line which is your film. And it will always help you when pitching the film or for yourself working on it. Then there's three elements, the exposé, the synopsis, the treatment. Um, and there it becomes messy. Some people, some directors, some writers, they go into the synopsis first or the exposé and then there are also like different opinions, what is what. But um, an exposé is mostly a one-page document explaining your story as a page. It's also good to start with this. You have it in front of you. Once you have your story written um, in a one-page document, you have something to be, to, to, to be you know, safe. You have it there, it's written, it's, you have it as a one-page. A synopsis is a couple of more pages. A synopsis is really explaining everything which is happening in the story. And the treatment is then the summary of the whole story, where every scene is exactly described. Um, I don't know why I have outline doubled. So then another important thing for the writer and then later also for the director is the intention. We talked about it earlier. Why do you want to make this film? Write it over, like, print it on a wall and put it over your laptop, over your computer, over your desk, or over your bed. And for Bon Voyage, it was, my intention was to ask this question, is there a reason to be afraid of the people seeking shelter in Europe? How do we or how would I react? This was my question. For me, I, I want to make films which are questions. I don't want to say I will give answers. I don't want to be a preacher with my films. I don't want to tell people this is how we should do it. I want to ask questions. And this is the, the thoughts and the questions I had for Bon Voyage. So now when you, when you have, you, you know, don't understand me wrong. Don't, you don't need to write exposé, synopsis, and treatment. It's, it's, it's sometimes some people, if you go into production, some producers, ask you for a treatment, but it's, it's good to write down the story and decide for yourself what you need, if it's something short or long. But what I very much recommend is to always write a scene order. A scene order is very simple, just a, a skeleton of your story. Uh, man walks in the bar, he sees the girl, they go home together. She doesn't like him, leaves. You know, like very rough, the story. Um, like a Google map, um, Google map direction, you know, turn right, turn left. Just like very, very, very rough. And then you go into writing the screenplay, which is mostly, you know, a screenplay. It's, it's a, as, as many pages a screenplay has, as long as you film mostly. If it's 15 pages, it's 15 minutes. They are, they are, rules how a screenplay should look like. And those rules are international. Doesn't matter if you are in Chile or if you are in South Africa or if you are in Hollywood. A screenplay 
will always be written um, in career 11 points. Always. And it has a simple reason. A producer wants to look through the screenplay and feel how much text is there. And if all the screenplays in the world are written with the same font and the same um, size, they are uniform. And it's very e quick, easy to understand how, how long a movie is. Um, there are softwares to write screenplays. You don't need them. You can just use Word, Microsoft Word, or whatever you work with, and use career 11 point, for sure. I, you should do that. But they are, there's the most famous software is called Final Draft, which is, it's a, you pay for it. I think it's $250, but I think there are also student versions. Um, this is the one which is being used most. And Celtix is a freeware, and there's more freeware, which works also well. But I think Final Draft works best. So um, this is how a screenplay looks like. Um, you have the scene number, the scene number, explanation, where it is, exter external, exter exterior, it's the, the time of the day, night, day, where? In the cockpit of the yacht. Scene 33. You describe very simply what is happening. It's not a novel. It's not Jonas in thoughts, stars at the sky, a warm wind is blowing around his nose. No, it's very, it's, this is a movie. It's not a novel. So you need to be very simple. Just describe. Jonas is steering the cockpit in a harness. Below deck, people are sleeping. We still hear the humming voice of Sylvia. So it's very simple descriptive. And then you have the text, the dialogue, like this. Every screenplay in the world, everyone, every screenplay, professional screenplay, looks exactly like this. So, I, yeah? Ah, so Google, Google Doc has a screenplay um, option. And it also writes the story automatically. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So because then what, what the main tool here is that here you can, you can jump the, the scenes. You know, you can now go to scene 11. Um, are we at scenes 11? Yeah, so, and what is really nice here, you can now, you, you, uh, view, view, uh, you it asks you, do you want to have a new scene heading, action, character, you say, okay, you want to write a character, you want to have dialogue, so character, and then the, the software remembers the names of your characters, so one is called Jonas, so it recommends you Jonas, and then you can write what he's saying. And that, that it's 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 really helpful and 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 uh, makes sense I think to to use the screenwriting softwares. So once once you wrote your story and you want to bring a crew together, you want to get money, you need to be able to tell people about your story. And I, I met many filmmakers who tell me, ah, I'm a filmmaker, and i cool, so what are you doing? I, I just finished the screenplay. And then they oh, cool, so what is it about? Oh, it's difficult to tell. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> I mean, if someone cannot tell you what kind of story the person wants to tell, I don't think that he can make or she can make a movie, you know? So you need to be able to pitch your story within, you know, two, three minutes, five minutes. And you can t practice with your mother, with your boyfriend, with your taxi driver. Taxi drivers are very good people to practice um, <laughs> pitching stories. And crowdfunding is at the moment, you know, a very good tool to um, finance films because with crowdfunding you can get money from people all over the world very easily into your project. 
But then again, you need to be, you need to pitch well. And I will tell you later how a little bit about, more about crowdfunding. Then the other thing is government funding, the Ministry of Culture. I was told that the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture just raised their budget 10 times, I think. And it was $1 million. Now they're $10 million in the budget of the Ukrainian Ministry of Culture for films. So $10 million every year the Ministry of Culture wants to spend and give filmmakers. I don't know exactly how, if they also support short films, but I don't know if your idea is good, maybe. But the government fund, no? No short film? Yeah? Short film, cool, yeah. Super, yeah. Um, NGOs, you know, like let's say you, well, you want to make a film about um, gay, a gay theme, a LGBT theme, and, and you know, there you, you uh, look up what kind of NGOs, what kind of organizations are there, um, and, and you, you partner with them and explain them your story you want to tell, and maybe they help you also to finance it, or it's an environmental topic, and you find an environmental ex uh, NGO. Another thing is cooperation with brands. Remember my second short film, Taxi Munich? I had it like, uh, this was f mostly financed by brands. I had, I had a, a petrol company, you know, like Aral. I don't know if you have Aral also here, but Aral is a petrol station, like Shell, BP. They gave me two and a half thousand dollars of petrol vouchers for the cars for free because this, the, the taxi, the main character is driving a taxi, as the name suggests, and the taxi is stopping at the Aral petrol station. And so they gave me two and a half thousand Deutschmarks, which, yeah, like dollars. Or I had one another character was using this tobacco you put into your nose. You know, what is it? I don't know the English word, but it's, it is, yeah, Schnupftabak is the German name. Sniff, uh, uh, sn yeah, yeah. So I had a company which also was giving me a box full of tobacco and I think two thousand dollars or something. But there you need to be very careful because you don't want, you don't want this to be, like product placement is good if it makes sense in the story, but if product placement doesn't make sense, it kills your story. You know, it, it really kills the story if there's suddenly like a product blinking in your, and then you better don't make the film. Um, or, or investors, but with short films, as I said, you can never really make the money back. So for investors, it's a little bit tricky to be in short films. So this is a, this is the, the bottom of the poster of Beau Voyage, um, which shows everyone who was involved in this financing this film. So the film was mainly produced by the joint venture film production company. This is a production company in Switzerland. Then this is the logo of the Swiss Ministry of Culture, which um, gave us money. This is the logo of the Zurich Film Foundation. They gave us money. Swiss Television. And now this is interesting. This is On Film Radio, Active Film, Cobblestone, and Joshua Tree. Those are four production companies for advertising. Um, it's a print mistake. Um, On Film is my Swiss production company for advertising. Radioactive Films, you know, it's the Ukrainian. Cobblestone is German. Joshua Tree is Indian. And I told them, look, I have this film. I want to make it. Do you want to pay me money? Director's fee for the future projects I haven't directed yet, commercial projects. And they said, all right, good. So, and um, I think Darko, for example, wouldn't be upset if I tell it openly. Radioactive Film gave $10,000 to Bobojaj. And in my next job, I do with them, I have to pay off the money they gave me. Sometimes I also did this by my last short film, Hotel Pennsylvania. And there it had the same. I had three production companies giving me 10,000 each, so I had 30,000. And when I got commercial jobs, the production companies told me, oh, Mark, we only take five back. The other five is a present because we really like the film. So people like, really started to support it through that. But this is also a way to finance, which works logically easier if you are already an established director. But if you do your first piece, it's probably a bit more difficult. Um, this is an NGO, it's the Catholic Church of Switzerland. 
they gave us 5,000 because they felt the story of Bon Voyage is about you know, human helping each other, so the Catholic Church wanted to give us money. Um, Swiss Films, it's an organization in Switzerland which is just supporting films and they are financing now the festival tournée. Yeah, please. Yeah. Look, in, in a short film, no, and like never, no. Because there is also, they cannot really do anything with the rights. It, unless it becomes a super success and you would want to make a movie or a TV show out of it. There are um, like online uh, platforms like Netflix or indie films where actually, today I met a producer of the Ukrainian guy, yeah. so he's um, uploading his films to these platforms and he's getting money. He says that it's, it's good because he's getting money. It's not like So he's uploading his short film on a, like on a this, Netflix platform? Something like this, like uh, Amazon has Video Direct now. And, uh, yeah, but Vimeo also has it, right? Yeah, and, but it's like, it's yeah. cool, like in the films, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's getting, so no, no, it, we made a short film for him, and we yeah. all gave him exclusive rights for all our work, you know, like a screenwriter, ah, and yeah. director, and so on, because uh, he, well, actually, he, it can be profitable now on the, on the internet. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah, if your film is good and maybe has even a bit of a known character in it and gets some festival success, a short film through VOD, Video On Demand, which Netflix and Amazon is, of course a film, a short film can also make some money. But if now Radioactive, you know, like if, if we go in this model that Radioactive or a production company gives you money, I think you can make a contract, you can tell them, look, I, I pay you, I mean, of course, then we really go into serious film financing because this is how it works, then you, you collect money and then you, you need to make a deal with the people who give you money at what point in the recoupment process the money goes back. So there is a pyramid scheme like some people who gave you money they are in the first position to get money back and some people most of the time yourself are you are in the bottom to get money back. So first everyone else who gave you money gets money. That's more, I think it's more like than really, a, yeah, then you can also do it with short films, you're right. It's then professional um, recruitment, like investing and recouping films. And in Bon Voyage cases, it's like an interpreting ship, and if you don't get back this money, should you give them back? Or? No, if Bon Voyage, in case, let's say Bon Voyage, no one wants to see it, and no one would like to watch it, and there's not one cent coming back. I don't have, it's not a problem. No one is expecting, no one is expecting, expecting the money to come back. It's a... Uh, People, I would still have to work for Radioactive and shoot commercials for them, you know. <laughs> this is how the money would have to come back. But, but um, not, uh, there's, no, like, there's no bank who is knocking on my door and says, hello, money back, you know. <laughs> or some mafia, mafia loaning where they want to cut off my fingers or something. <laughs> yeah. um, so, let's look at two models of how to finance in Bon Voyage, we, both models came together, luckily. Kickstarter, which is, Kickstarter is the biggest crowdfunding platform. The second biggest is Indiegogo, and there are many others. But Kickstarter is by far the biggest. I think they have I don't know, 10 million followers, but they also have 7,000 projects at the same time. So 10 million followers sounds good to you. You think, you know, oh, 10 million people will know about my project, and just if, if only 1% what is 1% of 10 million, 100,000? Just if 1% of 10 million will give me, you know, like uh, $1, then I will pff, my, my graph. But you, you, as bigger the crowdfunding platform is, Kickstarter is the biggest, as more difficult it is to get attention from, from the followers. So, but the most important, the, you know, the key is to reach the followers and to create um, attention. Um, I think I need to log in back here. This is Karma Students. And then it's hello. Hello. And then a number, no? Oh, one. one.
So on Kickstarter, you create, and it's for free, it's for free to create your profile, but once you've finished your project successfully, you have to pay, um, I think, 10% or something of what you make. You have to pay to Kickstarter, but to create your profile is for free. I don't want to go too much into details. There are different models. In, the, in, in Kickstarter, it's, you have to say how much money you want. So uh, I, I, I wanted 55,000. And if you don't get 55,000 within the days you choose, I choose 30 days, if on the 30th day you only have 54,000, you will get no money. And all the people who promised you money with their credit cards before, they will get their money back. So no one gives money no, if you don't reach, but the, you're pledged the, the amount you want. So I wanted 55, and I was lucky to get 57. But I also did a little bit of tricks, I have to say. So Radioactive, for example, they pledged the money. So the 10,000 Radioactive gave me it came through the crowdfunding platform. So I had a deal you know, with, with, with Radioactive, but officially it looked like, wow, this is really successful. But, and you know, of course, also, um, also um, um, the, the, uh, and this is actually the next thing. So you, you, need, you, you promise your, the people who give you money, you promise them presents. Here, if you give $5, um, I will, uh, we, we are very happy, yeah, so. And I think, didn't we also said, yeah. Then if you give $9 or more, you get a, a password to our um, last film, Hotel Pennsylvania. And if you give $10, I will write on Facebook, thank you. And if you get $25, we will uh, give you a password for the final film, and so on. So it goes up to um, $10,000. Um, and you see two are left from four. So two people pledged 10,000. And here you will be the executive producer credit and so on. But also um, Kama um, was also part of this. Um, here you see pledge 500. And this reward will sign you up to one of the 11 spring classes at the Kiev Academy of Media Arts. So this was a support I got from the academy here. And I got, you know, like from many, many different people they helped to make this crowdfunding successful on the pledger side, people who gave money, but also people who promised, like, helped me to, to give them um, interesting rewards. You know, the Posternak, Tanya and Genia Posternak, two photographers, Ukrainian, who are in New York now, very successful, they, um, they, they, they were donating paintings, or, uh, 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 not paintings, photo photographs. Um, I don't want to go too much into details, but I want to show you the, the most important part of your campaign is, is the video, your campaign video. You need to produce a video which is convincing the people, the 10 million Kickstarter followers, <laughs> to give you some money. And this video must be fucking good, because you are a filmmaker and you want to tell the people, I want to make a movie, a short film, so here's the video must already be very good. So you, you need to put a lot of like, thought in it. It can be very unusual, very funny, very, uh, it, it must, uh, very dramatic. It, it must create attention and transport the story and what you want to do. And the good thing about crowdfunding is not just that you help, that a lot of people help you to finance, but you already have a fan base for your film. Before you actually start to shoot, you have an audience. You have people who now want to know what you're making. That's another plus. So we, uh, I want to finish this chapter of um, financing, and then I would like, well, I think then we should do a little pause. So um, we said it's crowdfunding versus government. Um, So crowdfunding, you, you make a little film, you make a, 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 a platform, uh, you make a profile, and it's going, it's rolling. You have 30 days, and then you will know if you have the money. If you submit to a government organization, it will take a long time. 
and you have to make a very, very perfect presentation, and then you have to you know, pitch your story, and then you have to wait for weeks. I don't know how long it is here, but in Switzerland it's six to eight weeks after you present your project until you know if they will give you money. So you need to be more patient if you want to go with the government organization. And it's a lot of like paperwork. This is the submission for the Swiss government. Um, this is just a table of content, <laughs> synopsis, and my director's intentions, how I want to make the film from the light, the acting, camera, um, then like thoughts of the producer, how, what he thinks, what we want to do in, with the film when it's finished, a map of this, where the story takes place, then about written and wrote about the characters, the actors we had on board at that time, then a the mood board. Then uh, when you, uh, you when work, work with government financing in Switzerland, for example, this, this, um, this, the Ministry of Culture gave us $80,000. So they want us to spend the $80,000 on Swiss people. So it's Swiss tax money. So they said, you know, like, of course, we need to hire a Swiss composer. I'm Swiss, a Swiss, Swiss uh, producer, Swiss editor. And um, this is the deal. You have, I think it's, a, I guess it's similar in Ukraine. You know, if you get government from the Ukrainian, money from the government, you need to spend it on Ukrainians, which I think is, is fair. So you also need to present your whole crew and tell them who is Swiss, and you know, here it was like CH means Swiss, TK means Turkish, so, um, so that the people who decide about your project understand uh, where the money goes to, timing, then biographies of all the crew. It's a lot of work, and then you wait for eight weeks, but then maybe you get you know, some money, and this is, this is money which you don't have to pay back. You don't. It's, 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 it's a present to you. If it goes into a bigger scale, of course, you will have to pay it back, and movies and so on. Yes, so... Yeah, let's do one more chapter. Um, it's a very quick one before we do a break. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the most important thing is a screenplay, a good screenplay. It helps you to get money, it helps you to get crew, and it also helps you to get cast, good actors. And as younger and as unexperienced you are as a director, it's more important it is that you have fantastic actors. And you will be surprised the most famous actors, they sometimes they do little cheap short films because they know that they need to support the new generation of filmmakers. So, so dream big if you think about the cast for your film. Think of, you know, I don't know, what is the greatest, coolest Ukrainian actor mid-30s? Sure. Huh? We don't know him. Then create them. Make them. Um, so this is a... And then, and then the casting process is, is often painful because now you wrote the screenplay or you wrote it together with a writer and now you have actors coming to the studio and they play the scenes you wrote and then you get sh you're shocked. Like, fuck, this sounds really fake. I was working on it for so many weeks and now... And, and it's something which is very normal because it's a casting situation. So I want to show you once a casting situation and the real situation. How it, was, how it looked in the end. This is a scene when the sailors, the sailors on a sailing yacht discover the refugee boat. It's in, in Swiss German and it doesn't have subtitles, but um, I will try to make a direct translation. Stay with your boat. They will drown, we need to help. Are you crazy? Keep your possession. We will help you. Look, check them out. Hey, hey, Keep an eye on them. Hey, hey, hey. This is sailing vessel Archimeda. We will help you. We get help. 
We can reach a position in six hours. Hold on. Reto. They're gone. I lost them. I hope the Coast Guards will find them. What? And we're just sitting around? It's too difficult to find them. We must look for them. It's dark, it's dangerous. Don't you get it? Okay, then you sit there in this studio and you think, oh my god. But uh, in the end, after many weeks of rewriting your screenplay, it's also good, you know, when you work on your screenplay um, and then you do the casting, the casting will give you a lot of new inspiration for your screenplay. So never consider your screenplay as final, you know, especially in the casting process. So this is how the scene looked um, in the end. We had to recast the main actor. The guy you saw so far, he's not, um, he was sick, so I had to have another, another actor. Can we switch off this light now? Do you think that's possible? Because this is a very dark. So this is, yeah, casting versus the real scene. Um, and casting is the most important part of your pre-production. Locations, easy, light, you know, it's costume. It's not as important as casting. Focus on, on if your screenplay is good and your casting, if you find good actors, then it's difficult to fuck it up. Um, yeah. <laughs> do something which you really want to tell. Something you really want to do about. Not, not just because it's cool because you want to bring it to an audience. <sighs> Need a beer? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with this one. I still have a sip here. Ah. Sometimes I, I cannot believe it myself, you know, that we managed to make this difficult project happen. That we, it, I told you in the beginning how much money we had, but we needed this money to shoot out there at sea. It was also very dangerous. And it was, it was dangerous to bring up to 110 people out into the sea. And we, we didn't want anything to happen. We needed 
safety swimmers, security teams, and, and it was so weird to see that we just had to shoot a film and we have so much security and so many people are out there drowning, where we shot it in Kash in Turkey. We shot it at the place where people were drowning, where people tried to escape Turkey and go to Europe. We shot it right there and, and it was so uh, yeah, moving to, to, to feel how, how much this story means at the moment for us. Um, so, now we shot your film with a good crew and with an enthusiastic, happy crew. And now you go into post-production. And post-production is a dangerous thing because you could think, wow, we're done, we shot it, let's just cut it and finish it. But post-production is just as important as the actual shooting. Um, you, 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 the, the editing of your film is like writing it again. And you need to be open to change your story. The, the, people say you write your story three times. You write it when you write a screenplay, and then you write it again when you shoot it. Things will happen. An actor has an idea. Maybe it starts to rain, and you need to shoot something inside, but, and you have to change it. It's maybe better. Be open on the shoot to change it, but then also in the editing room, um, Try to work with an editor. Don't edit yourself. I think a director should not edit. I think you need someone else who has distance to your material and is more is looking from the outside at your material. But as a director yourself, you're quite connected to your material. Maybe you remember it was very difficult to shoot. We really need to have it in the edit. But maybe it's a bad scene and it doesn't really need it. And an editor from the outside, he would just kind of, you know, throw the scene away, kill the baby. We call it, you know, kill your babies. You need to, to throw things away in the edit. Find a really good editor you admire and let the editor, give the editor space. Let the editor edit alone first. Don't, you know, sit beside the editor and tell him, no, 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 don't cut here, don't cut there. Let the editor do an edit first and then you have a look and then you, of course, you need influence the edit, you're the director, but find a good editor and trust the editor. Then um, sound is so important. You know, you can have a bit of a shaky camera, you can have a little bit out of focus moments, maybe one scene is too dark, another scene is too bright, it's okay. But the sound needs to be good. It's very important that your sound is very good, that you have a good sound, sound recording, sound mix. People don't, f people forgive a low quality picture, but people don't forgive a bad sound. Nothing is more terrible than a film with a bad sound. So pay attention to that while you shoot, and then especially in post-production. Um, and once you know you have an edit and a rough sound design, do test screenings. Invite people to show your film. Don't, don't think, you know, it's my film and I know what's a good edit, it's finished and... No, as long as you can change the edit, invite people, the taxi driver, remember, and show it to, to people and, and feel, listen to their feedback. Some feedback might be super wrong, and it's like, yeah, they, but some feedback is also very helpful, so listen to feedback. And I, I do a lot of test screenings. My producer was even getting a little bit nervous because I was showing it to so many people, and he said, come on, Mark, let's finish it. Um, another thing which also is important when you do a short film and you don't have so much money, sometimes you get, you have to do ch money jobs and the film, your short film is being getting into a drawer and today it's a hard drive and it gets dusty and you don't finish the film. Ah, you know, it's just post-production, you can finish it later. Let's do this commercial, let's do this job, let's go on a holiday and finish the film later. Don't do it. Once you shot a film, Try as much as you can to finish the film. Finish it and then bring it onto festivals, bring it to the audience, but don't get stuck in post-production. A friend of mine, a great filmmaker, she just spent one and a half years on post-production for her short film. Now the film is finished, but it's so old already. Yeah? So go through post. So now your film is finished. Now it's important to uh, show the film to the world. Of course, you could put it on Vimeo right away, you put it on Facebook, 
let your Kickstarter supporters know about your film. And this is what the, your intention you will have. You know, you finished your film, you want to show it now, you want to show it. I hope you have this intention. This is the intention we should have as a storyteller, as filmmakers. But it's very important to give your film the best premiere, the best first screening. Because, and there you have to be patient. We finished the film around Bon Voyage four weeks ago, and now in two weeks we will have the world premiere, which is going to be in Palm Springs at the International um, Short Film Festival. And it will have a festival run, and after the festival run, we can show it to, you know, Vimeo, Vimeo on demand, or like on the video on demand and platforms. But first, be patient for a year maybe and enjoy the attention of festivals. So festivals is a bit of a crazy thing. There are, I don't know how many thousands of film festivals in the world which want to show short films. Um, Filmmakers divide the festivals into three categories. A festivals, B festivals, C festivals. A festivals are Cannes, Sundance, Venice, Berlinale, Toronto, the, most, the best festivals in the world. If you can show your film there, it's, it's fantastic. Then there are B festivals. Smaller festivals, I, I guess that the, probably the Kiev festival in, in November is probably a B festival. I think Odessa is also a B festival. Um, and then there are C festivals. So C festivals are, and they're great ones. I, I guess um, the one in Lviv, what is it called? Viz Art. Yeah, I think this is a, probably a C festival. But it's a very nice festival because Olya, Olya Reiter, who is actually uh, uh, doing this, she puts a lot of passion in it. and. So, so you need to try to get the premiere of your film to an A festival. But not all those festivals, they have their timing. So for Beau Voyage, the only A festival I was able to get in, I would have been able to get in, was Cannes. But Cannes, in the main competition, only allows movies to 15 minutes, and our film is 21 minutes. So there are other categories in Cannes which are very like, super like, experimental, intellectual, where Beau Voyage didn't fit in, so we didn't manage to get into Cannes. And we don't want to wait now for Berlinale, which in, is in, in, in January, or Sundance, which I think is end of January. We want to bring the film out now. So we were looking, which is the next good festival which has an international And I do think, I think Palm Springs is actually for short films an A festival, um, because it's Oscar qualifying what it means is some festivals, and it's easy to find it online, some film festivals, they are Oscar qualifying. This means when they choose your film and you win an award at this festival, the Academy of Motion Pictures, the Oscar people, will look at your film and consider your film as an Oscar-nominated film. So Palm Springs, my, my hope is that, you know, of course, I'm, we all should have dreams, and I hope that, you know, in Palm Springs, we win a prize. And then we have a chance that the Oscar Academy will look at our film. So this is just a part. Just, I, I show you the, the, whole, the whole list. Um, this is the, the moment the festival, why are we signed out here? Oh, no, okay, we don't wait for the code. You see it, it's, it's uh, put, put time in this. It's another trap as a filmmaker for short films. He's like, oh, no, I don't want to get all in this, like, festival. Spend some time, and you made a film. You need to make sure that people also see it. It doesn't help to make a fantastic short film and only your babushka can see it, you know? <laughs> you, you really want a lot of people to see it. So. Be careful, like really invest time in looking at research festivals. Here, this is, uh, this is sorted by deadlines. These are festivals in July. We um, highlighted it, the ones which are uh, where we, I think the highlights mean these are festivals we really want to go to. 
Um, we are submitting, there's also the Kiev festival, where we see the, the deadline when you have to submit it. Um, it's worth it. But there are meanwhile also online tools. Yeah, yeah. Some festivals um, are for free. Most of the festival, you know, as, as more A-list it gets, as more expensive it gets. I think the more expensive submissions are seventy, eighty dollars, and then some are free, and some are ten dollars, fifteen dollars, and. I understand it, you know, because it's also a little, I think it's not that the festival wants to make money, but the festival needs to protect themselves that not everyone is sending them their iPhone video. <laughs> you know, it's, you need to kind of stop the people a little bit by asking them for money. Um, I think if you, if you win um, Sundance with your short film, I think the C category festivals, some of them will maybe even pay you <laughs> for getting your film. Because it also happens. I don't know how it is with short films, but with feature films, if a film is very successful, other festivals will pay a screening fee to you so that they can show your film at their festivals. Yeah. There's, a, there's a different... Um, Organization like 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 a, how do you call it? You know like like um, web-based tools. One is called Without a Box, where you can create a, a, a profile. Like I had it already for Hotel Pennsylvania, my last short film, and for Beau Voyage, and um, you know and you you upload your film, you know connected to Vimeo with a password, and then this and then you can do festival search. You can search for festivals which take um, academy, like which is Oscar qualifying. You can check which festival, um, where is the deadline next. Um, it's, it's really a, it's super easy and super helpful. Um, here without a box, you know, you can see um, where's the deadline today. Okay, action on film, International Film Festival, Monrovia. I don't know. I guess it's a festival. Hamptons International Film Festival. This is a good festival. Um, a trick, a very, if you are not sure about how important a festival is, go to their Facebook page, check out how many likes they have. It gives you a little bit of a clue how big they are. If they have 220 likes, it's maybe not so big, you know, but if they have, you know, 100,000 likes, it's maybe a festival which is, is interesting for you. It's, it's difficult sometimes to sense which festival is important and which one is not. First, go to the important festivals. Some festivals, they only want premieres, world premiere or European premiere. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, like, like first try to, to get the greatest festivals and then to B and then the C list, you know, work your way through the importance of the festivals. Yeah. I cannot tell you. I'm more without a box because I know it. But without a box, did the, without a box did a very good redesign lately. Without a box really became. I think without the box is one of the oldest. Yes. But then um, they they were all film like film real, yeah. filmware, but also film real or something. There were a couple of new coming up, and without a box did a redesign, and I think right now they're actually very very good again. But I cannot tell you which one is the best. I'm sure there are forums discussing this. Mark, yes. What's your festival budget for Bon Voyage? What's that? What's your first of all, best of all budget? <laughs> the, the good, so for, for the submissions, I am just stupid and have a credit card and hope that it will not be declined. Um, so I'm, I'm not planning. I'm just, but that's stupid, I shouldn't, and, but <laughs> we didn't have it in the budget because, you know, we had a big budget, but we were, we are run out of money now. But I feel it's really wrong to save money, like to, to be, like now you did all this, now you need to bring your film out, so I'm just, I don't know what my, like, you know, if you're smart, you will have in, in your first starting budget already, like a budget for your festival submissions, but I don't have it. 
But luckily, because it's a Swiss project, the Swiss government is paying. The Swiss government has a list of festivals they support. So if the festival, like Palm Springs, where the world premiere is, is on this list. So now the Swiss, co Swiss government is paying me $2,000, paying for my air ticket, paying for my hotel and for my producer. P they're paying for printing the posters. Um, just for one for this festival because the Swiss government thinks it's a cool festival and they want to kind of show off that Swiss filmmakers are at this festival. But this is we are spoiled there in Switzerland. I, I, I'm, I'm afraid that, that Ukraine doesn't have this festival support yet. But maybe some of you will be in the Ministry of Culture in the future and create it. Yeah. So. A lucky thing will be that you find a distributor for your film. And What Media is one of the biggest distributors for short films. They do nothing else than to try to sell short films. I never heard of them, but my last short film, Hotel Pennsylvania, was um, screened at the uh, Clermont-Ferrand Film Festival. The Clermont-Ferrand Film Festival, it's like you, you reacted just with, you know, oh, what's that? <laughs> Clermont-Ferrand, never heard. It's the most important festival in Europe for short films. Because, you know, of course it's much better to be in Cannes or in Venice or at Berlinale or Sundance. But there you're just a little short filmmaker, you know, and there are all the big movies and there is Sofia Coppola and you're just a little short filmmaker. It's cool, you know, to be there with Sofia Coppola. But if you go to Clermont Ferrand, you are Sofia Coppola, you know, because it's only about short films. And they take it, and Palm Springs is the same now. The Palm Springs Festival is the Clément Ferrand of the United States. It's a festival which is only showing short films. So you are not uh, the young, cute guys who show their short films. And no, you, you, are, you are the celebrated short filmmakers. And to those festivals, the distributors who are distributing, who are selling short films are coming. So what happened is three years ago when I went to Clément Ferrand, with my last short film, Hotel Pennsylvania, um, what media came to me, a representative of them, and said, I want to buy your short film. What do you pay? <laughs> oh, $1,000. What? But you know, I paid $35,000 to do it. <laughs> um, but the deal you do with the distributor is that they give you some upfront money, and then they try to sell it, and you get normally like 60% of what they make. So they keep 40% and they give you 60% of what they make with your short film. So Hotel Pennsylvania was part of the Air Canada airplane entertainment program, for example. Um, when you were, and then and they to some Italian TV station. I don't know why the Italians were interested in this film, but so, so they took care of selling the short film and I got, you know, once a year I'm getting $1,500, $1,500. It's not a lot, it's nothing, but compared to what I spent, but it's money I wasn't expecting to get back because it's a short film, which is normally not so, so, um, so lucrative. But now with video on demand, as you ma mentioned earlier, I think it's time also to be a bit careful there. Another thing which what media convinced me with was that they were telling me to uh, create a uh, on, uh, uh, on uh, uh, what is it called, iTunes, and, uh, a program for uh, New York shorts, like five New York short films you can buy, you know, I don't know, for, for rent. And I, I was thinking that what media was taking care of my short film and will bring it to iTunes, which they didn't do yet, and I don't have the online rights. Um, but still now, what media is representing Bon Voyage again, and I don't really know what my <coughs> producer discussed with them now about video on demand rights. It's a thin red line, you know. I don't really believe that you can make a lot of money with a short film unless it really wins an Academy Award. Um, it's, it's, yeah, what do you think? It depends, I mean, of course, yeah, yeah. With Hotel Pennsylvania, I'm the sole owner of the film. I, 
I am the owner. I finance the whole film, so I get all the money. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. But with Beau Voyage, I don't own a film at all. It's not my film. Um, and I'm, I, I'm happy that someone who owns it now, Joel, you saw him in the video, he, you know, he brought all this money together to finance it and he took care of it all. So if the film makes some money back, the production company will get it. And only after the $250,000 came back, I will, I, and it's not I own, but I have the right for 10% you know, of the profit after all the investors are paid. I, yeah, I, somehow you can feel, uh, you can sense. I don't believe I will make. Mo I, I don't do short films to make money. I, 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 I quite a big budget. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Long time. Yeah, yeah. I think it should. Yeah, short films should bring you into feature films, and then you can make money in feature films. Right. Oh, before we do the Q and A, um, like you know, do a little bit more conversation. Maybe you have some questions and thoughts to share, I would like to show you the trailer of Beau Voyage to finish the story about Beau Voyage. I'd like to ask about Beau Voyage, uh, which camera you use? Yeah, it's, uh, it's Alexa, it's Ari Alexa um, X, XT, XT, I think. Yeah, XT, like the big, heavy super camera, which, <laughs> which was, uh, um, yeah, my, my cinematographer works a lot with available light. And especially on the sea, you don't have a lot of space to put lamps, so you really need to work with available light. And he really liked this camera for its, you know, perfect big chip and perfect sensitivity. I'm not so much into techniques as you can hear. Um, yeah. How many shoots? We were shooting nine days. Nine days. Nine days yeah, for Beau Voyage. Um, we had up to uh, seven boats. I mean, the basic setup was the sailing yacht. And then we had a support boat. You saw it in the behind the scenes video, the, the big support boat. There was the catering and the wardrobe. And then we had a little shuttle boat, which was bringing the people from the yacht for the lunch break onto the base boat. And we had also like a taxi, little taxi yacht, little taxi boat to bring people back to land. Especially in the first days, people got really sick and people were vomiting a lot because it was difficult on the sea. So some people had to go to be brought back to land. Um, but in the scenes where we had the refugees, there were 70 refugees, um, and we needed security boats and so on, we had seven boats. We also had a light boat, a boat which was, had a light on it, but the captain of this boat was stoned, I think, he smoked too much. And so he was like always kind of drifting somewhere, and <laughs> <laughs> so we had to, Cancel this, the light boat, and, and uh, yeah, but yeah, seven boats. Yeah. Yeah. Some other questions about Bon Voyage, because it may be nice to talk about Bon Voyage before seeing the trailer, which shows you uh, most of the scenes. Yeah. Um, the refugees on the boat, on the refugee boat, they were, um, they were extras, actors from this little town, Kash, where we shot fishermen, divers, and so on. But the cast itself were actually real refugees. So Jihad Abdo, Jay Abdo, you saw him in the interview, and he is, you could say, the Sean Connery of Syria. And he had to leave Syria in 2011 because the government wanted him to go on television and say that he supports Assad you know, which is a bit of a Yanukovych. Um, and, and he said, I don't want to do that. And then they, they threatened him to put him into prison. So he had to leave Syria and he went to Los Angeles and was writing to all the big casting directors and studios and directors and introducing himself as, look, I did 40 films and I'm, he didn't say it under Sean Connery, but he said, look, I'm, I, I did a lot of great films. And his name is Jihad. So they were all saying like, yeah, your, your name is Jihad, seriously? Maybe you call me tomorrow. And so he had to work as a taxi driver, Uber driver actually in Los Angeles and a pizza delivery man. Um, I mean, really, he was a superstar in the Middle East. And now on Facebook, I can see it. When I post on the Beau Voyage website something about 
she had Abdo, I get like <laughs> likes all over the world, comments in Arabic lettering. He is a superstar. <laughs> so so he, he, um, he did the movie with Werner Herzog, with Michael Kidman, Queen of the Desert, and then he, and he changed his name. He changed his name from Jihad to Jay, Jay Abdo, and now he is a Holly, he becomes a known actor in Hollywood now. He did a movie with Tom Hanks, and I did a movie with us. And, uh, so he's a true refugee, and then the little girl, you will see her in the trailer, a little girl, she, uh, Hala, she is from a Palestinian refugee camp, which was bombed into pieces. And her mother is an actress from Damascus who leave Syria. So they are, some of them are in that way refugees that they really live in a basement in Istanbul and have nothing. The father of little Hala, escaped to Europe in a little boat and he survived, but he's now in Germany and he cannot get his family come to, to come with him. So by hiring the little girl Hala, the money we paid her from our Kickstarter money, she could finance her family, her whole family for a month, which made me somehow happy. She was a great actress, but it was good to see that the money we pay her also helps her family. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. How do you find them? The actors. The actresses. Yeah. It's individual, you know, it depends on your project. In this project, we hired a casting director in Switzerland, Suzanne Müller. She did the casting in Switzerland for the two sailors. And we hired a casting director in Istanbul and Turkey. Uh, yeah, but the first casting director in Istanbul we had to fire. It was terrible what, what he proposed. Um, and then we I found someone else, but it was still difficult. And then my second assistant director started to cast. I mean, the, some of them are professional, but some of them, like Hala, the little girl, I found her in a refugee camp while I was doing the research. When I was doing the research for the story, I found this little girl and I took photos of her and then we started to cast her and my producer wanted her to play this role. But I said, no, she's a real refugee. We cannot throw her in the water. So like, now act, you're a refugee in the water, please, action. I felt, it felt wrong to do this as a director, to bring a real refugee child into this refugee situation. But we did castings with her and we gave her acting courses. And then we went, uh, went to a swimming pool in Istanbul. This was also funny. It was, in Istanbul, it's difficult to get, to find a public swimming pool. So the only pool we could find for a, swimming rehearsal with this little Palestinian refugee kit was in a super VIP luxury spa. So, so we went to this hotel and, and you know, we're rehearsing this refugee rescue scene in the swimming pool. And the little girl was fantastic, yeah. So Not big theme to make this short film? Yeah. This one, yes. But you can also make a short film which takes, care, takes place here in the, in the, in the cafe. Or, and, and I think in the beginning, it's always better to look for simpler stories where you uh, don't. What's your first film? Was it my, my first, more professional film was Taxi Munich, which was two actors in a taxi. Um, my second film was a man and a woman in a house. That's it. Uh, light, yeah. and et cetera. Yeah, I mean, there, there was light. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This is the nice thing about directing. For me, I'm, I'm so thrilled by the collaboration of people coming together. And my sh first big short film, Taxi Munich, I mean, my second film, but you know, my first short film, when I was 15, I did everything myself. There was no light. There was just a camera, and a Super 8, and this was it. But the second film, Taxi Munich, I had a cinematographer and she was doing it for free because she liked the script and she had a crew which was doing it for free um, because they liked the project, they liked me and, and, um, and we, even it was, I said, just to a taxi and two actors, it was actually quite complicated because we had a crane on a camera, camera on a crane traveling through Munich, um, which was a bit silly. Uh, today I would make it more simple. What I want to say is your first film should try to make it simple. Yeah. How much time did you spend for researching and writing and all this stuff before you start shooting? 
it's a difficult question to answer because the first idea for Bon Voyage I had five years ago um, when I was sailing cross Atlantic. Um, and I wrote, wrote it down and the idea was for a long movie. But a year ago, um, it was in March 2015, I made the decision to turn this idea into a short film. So it was one year from saying, let's do it, writing the screenplay, financing it, producing it, post-production was one year. It really depends, you know, it's difficult to but say. Maybe now if somebody notices your film, they can uh, turn it uh, in a feature film. Yes, yeah, it's good that you say that. Um, when this film was finished, um, my producers wanted me to turn it into a feature film. I said, look, Mark, this theme is so important. Um, it's going to be, let's make a movie. Let's write it down, like make a 100-minute story out of it. And they offered me a nice fee, like a serious fee, like, wow, yeah. And then I started to write. That's what I did the last six weeks. But I realized that I cannot tell the story again. I told it. And I told it as a short film, and it felt fake to tell it again as a feature film. And I also felt that there are many refugee movies out now. And, and I want to do something new. And so I turned this down. So if someone else wants to do it now, they're free. No, not free to do it, but we own the story. But uh, yeah. Is that a question? No, no. Ah, yeah. I want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so how, how did you not lose like, inspiration? Because you just had an idea five minutes ago, and the beats, uh, the old stuff, just a year ago. Like, is it was uh, the life? Yeah, I mean, I, my, my most important project, I started 12 years ago. And I will for sure need five more years till I can shoot it. Because it's a, it's a movie which will be at least $50 million budget will be needed to make this film. Um, it's a movie, also a sailing movie, South Pacific, takes place in the 70s. Um, it's an environmental sailing adventure. Taking play. It has to do with the nuclear bomb tests in the South Pacific. What I want to say is, as a filmmaker, you always need to be patient and to have different projects working on at the same time and feel what is the, when, is it the, when is the right time to push this project, when is this project ready. So altogether, I think if you look into my in-development folder, I have 11 projects in development. Um, and some of them, you know, one 12 years ago. Yeah. It's, it's, and I think it's, I read this, I know it from other directors. It's quite usual. And, it, yeah. and it's one moment you feel, I mean, no for Beau Voyage. You know, the moment was right. It was maybe even a little few months too late. I wish sometimes yes. we would have done it two years ago and not started it a year ago. Yeah. Some other questions, or should we look at the trailer? Yeah. Uh, did you edit your first movie? Uh, my very first movie when I was 15. Can you edit your movies? Like, if you don't have a team, will you do it? Will you do it? Um, yeah, but it was Super 8, you know? The editing on Super 8, it's like you have a scissors and you cut and you have a little glue and you stick it together. It's, it's not, yeah, I did it. Okay. But, yeah, but, yeah. but Taxi Munich, my first more serious short film, I had an editor, yeah. But you, you will always find an editor. I mean, th this, is, this is cinematographers, editors, actors. Those are the easy composers. They're the easy people to find to work for you for free. The difficult people are the sound engineers. It's difficult to find a sound engineer. It's difficult to find, yeah, makeup is sometimes difficult, wardrobe. But the, like, like a composer who is, is on their portfolio and like, like they, are, they are happy to do an interesting short film for free. An editor is doing like a, a short film, an interesting script for free. And you should, I mean, if you are, I, I understand where your questions are coming from, you're wondering for yourself, but if you introduced your idea to 10 different editors and they all tell you, nah, sorry, I'm busy, I don't like this project, it's either a bad idea or you have to edit it yourself. 
and then it becomes a super success, and all the editors will say, like, shit, why didn't I did do that? Yeah, but first you should always try to find the team. I mean, that's my, my opinion. As I said in the beginning, I can only tell you what I think, and some other people think really differently. I'm sure there are some autistic geniuses who do everything. I mean, Wes Anderson, and with Wes Anderson, you can forget, I mean, he has a team, but but his team is like, a, they are also Hitchcock was also like this. You had to, Hitchcock, let's, let's use Wes Anderson. When Wes Anderson was, because friends of mine were in his crew when they were shooting Grand Hotel Budapest, so I know it firsthand. So Wes Anderson was doing a storyboard of the whole film, and at home, he scanned every single frame from the shooting board and put it into iMovie, so probably it was Final Cut or, or, or Avid. But he, Wes Anderson himself, he edited the whole film only from the storyboard, and he recorded all the voices of all the characters himself. He was reading the whole screenplay into his little, you know, laptop. So before they started to shoot, Wes Anderson was finished with the shoot because he already edited everything. So, so he, he, of course, and then in the end, additionally, he has genius people to work with him. But the friend was a. Uh, the assistant director on the second unit. You, you understand what a second unit is, shooting the wide shots, just a, a unit which is shooting extra footage. And the director of the second unit from Grand Hotel Budapest was Roman Coppola. I was surprised to know that Roman Coppola, the son of Francis Ford Coppola, the brother of Sofia Coppola, is doing second unit for Wes Anderson, but he did it because he's a good friend of Wes Anderson and they own a company together, Directors Bureau, a great company for commercials also in Los Angeles. And, um, and my friend was together with Roman Coppola shooting those uh, second unit shots. And then when they set up the camera, I don't know who the cameraman was, but I'm sure it was a genius cameraman as well. It was a Wes Anderson movie. So they put up the camera, you know, like wide shot, the train in the landscape. And then Roman Coppola is there. And then Roman Coppola needs to take his iPhone and he shoots a photo of the screen on the camera. And he has to send this to Wes Anderson, email it. <laughs> and then they were waiting beside the camera. <laughs> Until, ping, you've got mail. Wes Anderson wrote, camera, a little bit more left. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then they had to do that. So that's how Wes Anderson is working. He, he will probably, if he doesn't, he wouldn't, in the beginning, I wouldn't be surprised if in his first short films, he wouldn't have had an editor. He would have edited everything himself, I guess. <laughs> yeah, he, he looks so, no? He looks like so interesting. He looks, he, Wes Anderson looks like a character out of his movies, like his tweet. Uh, yeah. Okay, some other questions? Which one? Like, hold up. Hotel Pennsylvania. Hotel Pennsylvania. I can uh, show you. Uh, I can tell you now the link, and you can watch it. I give you a password. But Beau Voyage, you can't yet. Beau Voyage needs its festival um, festival uh, uh, premieres first. Live. And, yeah, yeah, and later then for sure. But I hope it's going to be shown in Kiev, at the Kiev Film Festival. Uh, so I quickly give you the um, tell you where you can find. Hotel Pennsylvania, and you can write me. A, hmm? And you can write me a little message and tell me if you hated it or loved it. So this is the Hotel Pennsylvania. You need it bigger? Does it work?
Okay, now the, the trailer is not finished. It's still a work in progress. Alex Chorney is editing it. I think some of you know him. Um, yeah, so here is the trailer. Wow. This is fast. Thank you.